Welcome to Backstage with Becca B with special guest DJ Plunkett. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Backstage with Becca B. On this episode, he's performed regionally in shows like Sweeney Todd, The Little Mermaid, 42nd Street, A Christmas Carol, and more. Plus, he is currently part of the cast of the Wicked National Tour, where he stars as Bach. Please welcome DJ Plunkett. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Very, very good. Let me just put you on my full screen. There we go. Perfect. So how have you been during this time? I've been pretty good. I've been in New York City just hanging out. I'm very, very, very ready to go back to work. I can imagine. I can imagine. And how has New York City been? I mean, I've uh, I've heard it's been great. I've heard it's been actually really good considering. It's it's a little bit back to normal now. Um, I was here pretty much the through the entirety of quarantine. Um, and last March it was definitely a ghost town that felt a little post apocalyptic. Um, <laughs> but now it's it's pretty much back to normal now. I love that, and it's yeah. I mean Broadway is so close to coming back so it's like so slowly close. creeping and you're like okay this is the new york city i know mm -hmm, definitely the restaurants cool. are starting to come back it's yeah. definitely it's definitely we're almost there we're so close we're almost there almost there <laughs> and i mean you you all are the first tour back the wicked tour I know. which you're that, on i don't think that that has fully hit me yet you know, like I think being the first back, the first Broadway series show back in the entire country is yeah. wild to me. And I'm very, very lucky and privileged and honored to do that. I mean, it's wicked, so it doesn't shock me, but also at the right. same time, like I'm like, I mean, yes, of course, because mm -hmm. it's my favorite show. Same. <laughs> so, well, I'm going to get more into wicked, but. Sure. Have you always known that you wanted to be a theater performer? Yeah, I really have. Um, I have always been a bit of like a Disney nerd myself. So like I, I loved Disney. I love Disney World. I would watch every, I mean, probably aging myself and saying VHS tape, but um, watched all of those and I was also, and I'm not ashamed to admit this, I would use my blocks and little action figures and weevil people and playmobiles to build sets and like just make shows and puppet shows. And I would direct my my little brother and cousins and little things. So I was, it, I always had that theater bug in me. Oh my goodness. So yeah. did anyone ever think that you would like be working maybe behind the scenes too? Um, I don't think so. Well, it's, it's interesting because I was also a really shy kid. So I think when it finally came down to, I, I, the first show I did was when I was nine and my aunt saw an ad in the newspaper for Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat at a local community theater. And I remember she sent it to my mom and was like, would DJ want to do this? And I think my mom was like, I don't think so. I don't think he would he has it in him to do that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure, let's try. And yeah, that's where it all started. What's your favorite Disney movie? Ooh, okay. So it's a tie between Little Mermaid and Hercules. Okay. The Hercules was a little more unexpected, but yeah. Go the Distance is like, that song gives me chills every time, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's one of those like inspirational songs that like, especially I guess through this time, I wonder if anyone's like been watching it on repeat. Oh, I don't know. I, have, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Disney Plus. That was like the first streaming service that I was like, ooh, yes, give it all. <laughs> and Disney World or Disneyland? Okay, uh, Disney World. I'd actually never been to Disneyland for the first time I went last year. Yeah, la or that's not last year because last year was still COVID, but um, when we were doing the show in Vegas, a few of us um, did a little road trip down. Ooh, yeah. cool. I was, I mean, I was just in Vegas as I emailed you. So Wait, getting to How was your trip? Was it amazing? <laughs> it was so good. It was my first time in Vegas. It's so wild. It's I was a wild like, place. it's so cool. It yeah. like, I totally get why people love it there. I mean, I didn't really spend time at the casinos, but Mm -hmm. I don't think you need to. You're so. I was gonna say I, I really didn't either. Yeah. 
yeah, you're so busy doing everything else. And I'm like, why lose money? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Love that. Yes. So do you remember what the first show you saw was that made you think that like, wow, this is actually a job that I could do? Um, the first show I ever saw on Broadway was Beauty and the Beast. <gasps> um, yeah, and that was, so that was yeah. really special. The first show I ever, ever saw like in my life, um, me, okay, this is actually wild. I saw Sherry Lewis, who is the um, creator of Lamb Chops. Oh my did a one woman show at Northern Music Theater. And I remember she ran onto the stage in a red sparkly jumpsuit. And that's basically the only thing of the performance that I remember because I was young. Um, but I just remember being like fully, fully enchanted by that. And yeah. And I, and I grew up in Boston, so I had a lot of the Boston theater scene at my fingertips. Um, so I, I'm actually really lucky that from a young age, I was kind of like, I know this is what I want to do professionally. Yeah. And I mean, Boston's like the East Coast. So, I mean, theater's good there on the it's East really Coast, good. especially. Yeah. It's good everywhere in the U.S. And I think it's really underrated on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. But like, there's a lot of well-known theaters on the East Coast regionally. Yeah. Yeah. as well as Broadway. So how did you get involved and become like a well-rounded theater performer as you were growing up? Um, I mean, that's actually a really good segue because I I had so many regional theaters right in my backyard in Massachusetts. Um, so I, I started auditioning really, really young. The second I, I started doing community theater, I was like, this is it. I want to do the big leagues I want in right now. Um, so I auditioned at North Shore Music Theater, at the Greater Boston Theater Company um, for sometimes national tours that would come through Boston, would audition local children if they needed them. So I, I started working professionally really young, which was really, really cool and really lucky that I, I'm, I'm learning now in the business that a lot of people didn't have growing up in, in um, different places. So I, I kind of hit the ground running really, really young. And I'm, North Shore Music Theater was really my home, my home base that I, I'm a North Shore Music Theater kid through and through. Um, And they used to have a really, really fantastic training program. So I took voice lessons and dance classes and um, acting and all of, all of the things as well as auditioning for their shows. Were you inspired by like the older, the adults in the show constantly? Because I did children's theater as a child and I, and I'm more behind the scenes now, but uh-huh. like, it was so cool just like being in shows with like the older kids oh, and yeah. like making friends with the older kids as like a six year old and being like, hi, you were so good today. That, <laughs> but, was, that was definitely me. I, I actually have like really specific memories sitting in tech rehearsals of A Christmas Carol at North Shore Music Theater where I would, the rest of the kids would kind of be either in the green room or um, playing around. And I actually remember there was one time where it was kind of like, where did DJ go? And they thought they like lost me or the with child wrangler was like, where did he, where is he? And I was literally just sitting in the back of the dark theater watching the adults work. I, oh, I was fully like, I want to know everything about this. And I want to see every single scene transition and lighting cue happen. Yes. So when, when it came time to start auditioning for college, how did you like start how did you feel, start feeling prepared? Because college auditions, they're hard from what I've heard, especially yeah. with computer programs. College auditions are wild. Um, you couldn't pay me to do that process over again. <laughs> I'm very happy that it's over. Um, I mean, it takes a lot of research and homework, honestly. And so I, I kind of, through the industry and through friends figured out what the top programs were and where I wanted to audition. And um, I had a really good vocal coach that that helped me through things. And um, yeah, I, I, I just like trained and, and worked on it, my material over and over and over again. And then I honestly traveled the country for a little bit with with my mom and dad and auditioned for places. So you like so you got to see like a big part of the country and you got to like be like okay sort of, it was fit in? sort of it, I mean it was more of like very quick weekend trips to like Ann Arbor Michigan or Cincinnati or Pittsburgh yeah. you know the 
the places where everything is was just like a very quick day trip. So, <laughs> so you went to University of Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, was, what yeah. made you decide on that school as opposed to as opposed to other schools? Yeah. Um, I knew that I wanted to um get out of Boston just because I was too comfortable there. Um, so when I, cause I had, I had also gotten into the Boston Conservatory and I was like, that would be so amazing, but I definitely, I want to, I want to move away. I want to experience, I needed to like leave to grow up a little bit. Um, and I knew I wanted a conservatory training. So CCM was kind of the, the option for me. It was, it's amazing. It's a incredible, incredible school. And it's a, it's a factory of stars. So I was very, very lucky to get in at all. <laughs> that makes sense that you wanted to move away because like looking back, like, okay, I wanted to be close to home during college at first, but like, and like, as you get in more into adulthood, you're like, you're like how can I get more independent? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I was, I've always been super independent and I was definitely like, I want to, no matter where it is, I want to leave and come back kind of a more grown up person. Yes. So what's the most valuable thing going to University of Cincinnati taught you? Oh, wow. So much. Um, I mean, just in being a, a person, I, I was already living in apartments and, and, you know, doing all of that. So I, I had to grow up very fast and start paying rent and figuring out how to do all of that. So it was, re- it was a nice like way to ease you into um, just adult living in that way. As far as the training goes, I, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, they taught me professionalism, how to act, how not to act. Um, they're, my voice teachers there are top notch. Um, yeah, across the board, it was just spectacular class A training. Do you have any advice for kids auditioning for colleges during this time or like in the future because I mean yeah. it's rough yeah um I think and this is this is this goes for a lot of things too whether it's a college or a role that you want or maybe an agency that you're looking at when you start showcasing after college um it's just as much about what you want than what the program wants so if you're not accepted somewhere don't mourn that. Just be like, okay, that's not, that wasn't for me. Um, there are plenty of places that I didn't get into, plenty of shows that I have not been cast in. Um, and as much as that made me sad at the time, I now realize looking back on it that that was never meant to happen because if they didn't want what I was bringing to the table, then it wasn't for me. So I think just do you and bring your best self to the table and if they're interested, fantastic. And if not, then it has nothing to do with you. And you can just be like, cool, that one's not for me. Cause I want, I want to be somewhere where my talents are, are honed and respected. Yeah. And everything happens for a reason. Exactly. It's down to it. Even if it's disappointing at the time, it's like, there's a greater reason somewhere that you're going to find out for why that happened. Yeah. And there's also, so many programs now they, they exist everywhere and I will say that any program you go to you will get out of it what you put into it there are plenty of people that go to CCM in Michigan and Carnegie Mellon and Boston Conservatory that are spectacularly talented and don't work very hard and kind of leave the way they came in and there are people that go to programs that no one has ever heard of before and emerge the biggest Broadway star because they put the work in so that's the most important thing and I want to get into Wicked, but I love talking about regional theater. Yeah. What do you think makes regional theater so special? Because I've talked a lot about regional theater to people on my show. And it's, I mean, it's community and it's just as special as the big scale, like Broadway national tour shows. I'm, I'm so happy you brought that up because, I mean, I know it's especially um, kind of a big topic in our industry right now with, um, Broadway being almost too central in in the industry. There's so much good theater that happens on tours in regional theater and community theater. And all of that is so important. I mean, my entire career post-graduation was in regional theater and I 
met some of the most incredible actors and amazing friends and put on some really spectacular shows around the country. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you, that you asked about that. Do you have a favorite show that you've done regionally? Mm -hmm. I was Flounder and Little Mermaid. At, I, I was that. like, not to throw it back to Disney, but I was Flounder and Little Mermaid at Arkansas Repertory Theater in Little Rock. Oh. And that show is really special to me for a lot of reasons. It is how I got my equity card. So I joined the union with that show. Um, oh. I Like I said, I love The Little Mermaid. So I could have done, I would love to play Flounder again. I could play Flounder eight shows a week for the rest of my life. That show is so fun. Um, and also to this day, it is still the most friendly, wonderful, loving cast I've ever been a part of. It's It's so rare that you, that a creative team can put together, I think there were 25 of us that were all just immediate friends. Like no questions asked. We were just like pushing tables together um, at restaurants to like be closer to each other. It was it was such a fun experience. You were, you were like the theater kids on the in the viral TikTok videos coming into like Denny's at like 12, 12 o'clock. Literally after that, that. yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, it was, it. it was really, really special and um, and the production turned out really wonderful. I think that energy ended up spilling out into the audience. And it was, it was a, Under the Sea was a party on stage because we all loved each other. Yes. So it was really fun. What was it like stepping into like a movie that you loved as a child and like stepping into a set in real life? Because I'm sure you were like, yeah. oh my gosh. It like was fun. In particular, the costumes in that show were the stars were the stars of the show. It was it was an incredible costume package that was built from scratch for us. So um, wearing the costume was really was really wild and special. Um, I, I implore anyone to dig deep enough into my Instagram to find it because it's I ha it's wild. Um, but yeah, it was it was really fun. I, I ended up watching the animated movie a lot to figure out my version of Flounder because, you know, there's the Broadway version, there is other regional theaters that had done it. Um, it was a literal child on Broadway. So yeah. I, I didn't, I couldn't bring that to what my version of Flounder would be. So I kind of went right back to the animated movie and, and, and tried to bring those expressions and isms and Flounders just being a little guppy. Yeah. <laughs> How, how do you do that? Like, did that really like teach you like how to make characters your own on stage? Because sort of, yeah. I um, I mean, a lot of it had to do with my training as well, but I tend to play um, a lot of heart-based characters. And so that lends itself really, really well to a Disney sidekick. Yeah. So with, with most of my work, um, if it is appropriate for the character, I will always lead with my heart. Oh, I love that. And Flatter's like yeah. the best character ever. I wanted to- Flatter's like, the best character to do that with. He's just, he's just, just yeah. blushes all the time. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted Flounder as a kid. Like I wanted to adopt a Flounder. I love that. I was There's like- also not enough Flounder merch. There needs no. to be more Flounder merch because I remember when I was in Disney World, I was like, I want a Flounder pillow. I want a Flounder everything. And I couldn't find it. <laughs> they have, they have like the little mini like Simbas which mm -hmm. like I'm totally cool with. I ha actually have like a mini Simba because it was so cute. But yeah. like they didn't have enough flounder merch. There's a mug. There's a mug that exists because a friend of mine was like, I thought I would buy you a mug, but then I didn't think you'd want a mug. And I was like, I would have wanted it. <laughs> Get it for me, please. Now you're going to have everyone when when Wicked resumes, We're everyone sending me your flounder mugs. bringing yeah. you like flounder merch. <laughs> Let's just put it out there. So I, I already, I will say to people, I already have most of it, but. I will always accept more. <laughs> like flounder drawings. You can just like yeah. class the hotel rooms with flounder fan art and stuff. Yeah, he's definitely my favorite. That's so cool. That I love that you love Disney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the best. And it's like the more, most like pure hearted. Mm -hmm. so. so Wicked, how did you get the audition for Wicked? And what was your reaction oh. when you heard that you got the audition for Wicked? Cause that's a huge show. Yeah, so that's actually a lot longer of an answer. Um, my journey with Wicked was not a typical audition callback booking. So my first audition was back in 2015. 
Um, I had just graduated college. My agent submitted me. I got the appointment, was super excited. I went in and did all the material, did really well. And um, the feedback was really wonderful. They were like, we really like him, good job. And then like crickets, 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 didn't hear anything. And then six months later, I got another audition and I went in and it was, I don't know, I think a different casting associate and I did it all again. And it was like, great, he did a really awesome job, thanks. And then crickets. And oh. that repeated itself for four years. Um, I went in, I think my final count was nine times um, over the course of four years. Yeah. It. And it was always for different people. It was either for a music director or an associate choreographer or a resident director or a casting associate or intern or whoever it was. Um, I just kind of consistently always went in. And, I, and on my end of things, I started to get a little bit frustrated because I was like, I'm, I'm doing me. This is, you know, what I do. Um, and it never, it was, it was always just not my time. And I finally took some classes and worked with the creative team a little bit more. And the last time I went in for it was December of 2018. And everyone that I had ever auditioned for in the past or previously impressed or not was behind the table and they had rec they were recording it. And I was like, great. And it was, they were and at that point I had known everyone. So it was like, hi DJ. And I was like, hey, yeah. good to see you all. Um, and after that, it was another situation where my agent called me and was like, they really loved you. You did a great job. Crickets, 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 crickets. And I was like, and I was like, that's all I have. I don't know. I don't know what else I can bring to the table. And I think it was six months later, it was around April. Um, and I was babysitting and I was on the balcony with the toddler that I love. And my agent called me and he was like, I have a, a an offer for you. And I was like, for what? Because I was in my mind, I was thinking, that's weird. I haven't auditioned for anything in a little while. And the last thing that I went in for was um rock of ages off broadway which i knew i did not get so i was like did they change their like, mind <laughs> and he was like no it's for what you think it is and i was like i i you need to tell me i don't know i don't and he was like you're gonna play bach and wicked and i was like oh i like picked up the toddler ran in the living room called my mom it was it was all so 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 magical and wonderful lots of tears um it, it was the culmination of years of work and networking and auditioning and callbacks and, and not booking it so many times. Um, Which is so weird yeah. because like, I feel like people think that it's magic and it that- It's so not magic. <laughs> some people, yeah. but very rarely is it magic and very rarely does it happen overnight and mm -hmm. do you get the audition like, or do you get the role right after the audition? Right, and I, I, that's really important to, that's always my story that I that I think is important to share because that's my journey with Wicked. But then there are other shows where Little Mermaid, for example, was audition, callback, booking. And then there was a summer stock production of Big River that I did that kind of came out of the blue and was an offer that had happened from a previous show that I did where it was like, the audition really wasn't even a thing. It, it was just like, oh, we trust DJ, we know him. So there are there are situations where you're just kind of like given it and there are situations where you're like auditioning over and over and over and over again. So yeah, and they want to find- in all different ways. And they want to find like the cast you match with. And exactly. Like, like the people on stage is all about like the chemistry, like who's going to fit best together on stage, the right time, the right, mm -hmm. like, I mean, and, and, everything and I think so I'm I'm very very grateful that it happened when it happened for a lot of different reasons. Um, but mainly, I appreciate it so much. There is not a second that I've spent in this company that I haven't been um, not fully enamored with what I'm doing. It's it's never not magical. I keep using double negatives, but it's it's so magical always. I mean, yes, Wicked is like one of those like timeless shows. What mm -hmm. made you keep going in 
to audition and like want to keep going into audition because like I can imagine that takes a toll on you to oh yeah like, am I gonna I get it this time? to be an actor you have to have a thick skin that's just is a given is what it is. The amount of rejection and no's you will receive are a hundred to every one yes. Yeah. So on one hand, you kind of just have to let it roll off your back. If some, like I said, with college or since if someone's not interested, then they're not interested and it's not personal. It's just, you know, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too whatever. Um, but yeah, no, it definitely, it definitely took its toll. I, I, am self-described as ruthlessly ambitious. So when I set my sights on something, I will I will fight until I get it, so. Well, that comes in handy in this industry. Exactly, yeah. So was Wicked always like kind of a dream show for you? Because I feel like it is for a lot of people. Yeah, whenever people are like, what's your dream role? I'm like, I'm doing it. <laughs> right now, right now, this one. This one, yeah. When it did you first see Wicked or hear the soundtrack? Oh, I first heard the soundtrack when I was young. Um, and I remember, I actually remember I was doing, I was doing the Jungle Book Kids at North Shore Music Theater. Yes, and definitely. someone was playing Defying Gravity. And I remember being like, what is that? And it was this new thing that I had never heard of before. Um, but the first time I saw the show, I don't remember the year, but I saw it on Broadway and I saw, um, Shoshana Bean and Megan Hilty do it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so, it was quite a cast. Legends, uh, yeah. Because Ben Vereen was also the wizard and Rue McClanahan was Morble. It was, it was like, if I, I, I would have, that's a dream cast. <laughs> yeah, so you got to see Shoshana like flying in the air, belting Defying Gravity and you were like, I, did. Sure I did. like this. And that's actually one of the reasons that um CCM was so attractive to me she's also a fellow CCMer so oh. it, was, it was cool to then go to the same school and learn the craft with so many people that had done Wicked oh my goodness that's yeah. that's amazing and you were and you had that on your resume for like when Wicked audition mm -hmm. came around so they were like <laughs> okay a lot yeah. of Wicked alum have come from here that is true like this school is obviously good when it comes to Wicked mm -hmm. and when it comes to when it comes to like people being prepared for this show. Yeah. Do you remember who the first Bach you saw was? I don't. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Wow. You know, no one's ever asked me that and I actually hadn't thought about it until now. I don't know who it was. I'm going to have to go look that up because I know I have the playbill somewhere. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> I'm so curious now. Maybe yeah. at the end we can find out. I need to look that up. That's actually really fun to, that would be good, cool to know. So when you got in to Wicked, how quick was the rehearsal process? And how quick, how much time did you have to prepare for your stage debut in Wicked as Bach? Yeah, so that that big booking call that I got was in April and I was not joining the tour until the end of July of that year. So I had like three months to keep it a secret, um, which was hard, <laughs> which is really hard. Yep. Um, and after those three months I went and, excuse me, I had 10 days of rehearsal and a put in. Um, which is not a lot, but enough. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I came in very, very prepared. I, I mean, having auditioned for it for so long, I was, I was like, I know what I'm getting into. There were still parts of the track that I was like, I never knew this existed. This is crazy. Um, I had also never replaced in a show. I'd always worked regionally where I was putting together a show with, exactly. um, full companies of people that had been cast at the same time as me. So learning Wicked with just a dance captain and a stage manager by yourself is was a whole new experience that I had never, just a muscle that I'd never exercised before. Yeah, so you're learn, you learn it by yourself and then you have one put in rehearsal where you're the only one in full costume makeup and wig. And um, that's your one shot with all of the technical elements before you open. So that's a, that is a stressful day. <laughs> and um, is Bach in the beginning scene? Yes. Did you know that? No, no, I didn't know that. I didn't know that I, I got to be in the opening number, which was really, really exciting. Um, because I get to have, you know, a crazy 
mob coat and wig and hat and cape. Um, so you were like, this is unexpected. Yeah. And actually the opening number is, I think, the hardest number to learn in the show. There's so many, the tracking in it is, and the musicality to it is wild. So that was the one thing that I was like, oh, I wasn't prepared for this. Here we go. <laughs> I wonder how many people like come into Wicked not knowing like as Nessa and Bach and Fier, like not knowing they're going to yeah. be in the opening number of the show. And they're like, wait, has this always been in this way? <laughs> right? It's, I, I actually really love it though. For me, it was a pleasant surprise because I, I love the opening number to Wicked. It's kind of, it's a, like a cannonball into into the the world of the show. So I actually am really, really grateful that I get to be in that big explosion that happens right at the top of the show. How quick is the quick change between that number and the first scene that you you come on as Bach? It is, I wanna say 26 seconds. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> because Bach is the first entrance in Shiz. Um, so yeah, that was actually, that's actually one of the most stressful parts of my track that I feel like not many people even realize is, is a thing. Um, I mean, I'm all, it's, it, it's underdressed and there's a lot of, um, quick change tips and tricks. Like there's, there's magnets and snaps and, and everything that make that happen. Gotcha. Um, and all, and a wonderful dresser, but it's stressful. I didn't make it on my put in. It was actually the one thing I had to do like three times before it before I got it down, which is interesting too because you know, I think people think like rehearsing on stage and your performance on stage is what is the most important, which it is, but the thing that I had to work on and rehearse the most actually was backstage changes in choreography. Yeah, I was going to say there's choreography backstage in the show that you have to learn and you have to do to be able to get yeah. that on the stage. And it's just as intricate, if not more so. Wow. Yeah. What's the hardest scene besides that scene where you have to come back off, where you have to exit and come back on? <laughs> um, technically, it's a scene that I'm not allowed to talk about, but I think everybody on this channel has probably seen Wicked. So I'm going to do it in a way that is a wink, wink. Um, my character goes through a certain change in the show and I have very little time from that scene to my bow in the curtain call to get out of that costume and into my governor's mansion costume. And I have to take a shower in the middle of the show, which is something that I didn't know or think about before. And it is really stressful and feels like counterproductive to be in the shower while the show is happening while I have to go back on stage. So yeah, I have to take, I wanna say maybe like a three minute shower. That's basically the length of for good. And then I have to get dressed during the melting scene and oh be back on stage. Yeah, it's always, that's, that's the quickest um, kind of everything has to constantly be moving and I have to keep my ear on the monitor and make sure that everything is happening on time and that, yeah, that I'm in the shower and out of the shower and dry and it's, it's crazy. You're like making sure that the Glenda and the Alpha haven't like broken down during four good and it's like taking like 20 extra minutes. Right. Well, that would be great if that happened. <laughs> like that would give me a lot more time to, to get ready. But, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And especially on tour, part of the, the challenge is we're in a different venue always. So my dressing room and the shower is always in a different place. Um, so figuring out the traffic and the timing of that is always um, a little crazy. The first few shows where I'm like, I, I know I have to go down this set of stairs and figure out the labyrinth of, of the backstage in whatever venue I'm in that I've never stepped foot in before three hours before that show. <laughs> How, wait, how many, how much rehearsal time pre going into a new venue do you all get? None. Yeah. So it's like, good luck. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, we have a sound check. So that, so we'll have, when we get to a new city, we'll, uh, we'll have a company meeting usually at, this is weird to remember because I'm like, I guess I'm about to do this again. I should remember it. Uh, three o'clock is a company meeting where we'll talk about kind of the city and the venue. And if there's any, um, weird things about this space that we need to know or safety things in the city that we need to know. Um, and then at four, we'll do a sound check 
which is pretty quick. It's it's really just every character, um, every character's big moment, if you will, and only like a cut of it. Um, so it'll be like the end of Wizard and I. Um, Nessa and I will do Ozdas. Fiera will do the top of Dancing Through Life. Like it's just very like snippets of different things to make sure that you're on the stage, your mic is working, and you can kind of walk through what it will feel like on in that space. Um, and then it's dinner and the show starts. <laughs> yeah. So I always spend my dinner break kind of just like walking around the space, just figuring out, figuring it out. Um, and also meeting my dresser who is about to do that 26 second change that I've never met before. So it's it's also about kind of like training that person to be like, this is when you take my hat, I'm gonna take my coat off here. And yeah, the first show, it, it keeps everyone on their toes. I mean, I can imagine because like, what if something's like slightly different backstage? It's like, wait. Oh, and it always is. Like yeah. there, there's no backstage in America that is that is the same, so. <laughs> yeah, so it changes like the whole backstage mm -hmm. blocking. Yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah. Wow. So how do you make the character of Bach your own? That's a really good question. Um, I, kind of going back to what we were talking about with Flounder, I always lead with my heart. And that is quite literally the perfect way that Bach is directed as well. It's the most important thing in, in his track is that he has the biggest heart of anyone on stage. So I, I try to just bring me and my energy to, to that. Um, I, you know, we live in an age where any, you can find any bootleg of anything anywhere. And so I have definitely watched all of them. I'm not going to lie. And I have seen most people do the role. And I think it's important to kind of honor the legacy of the 17 years that have come before me because, you know, somebody has probably figured out a way to do this that works. So I, I like hearing from our team and respecting that. But at the same time, once it's filtered through my body and my voice, it's going to be me naturally. So I just try to lead with my heart and, and be me and bring myself to it which seems like a really maybe like simple answer, but I, I truly believe like once it's filtered through me, it it can't be anything but me. You know, I, I'm not Robin De Jesus, I'm not Riley Costello, I'm not Andy Mientis, these wonderful, amazing performers that have done it and are doing it. Um, it's going to be different, even, if, even though we're saying the same lines. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, that's what makes live theater so special. The like Wicked fans, especially, they want to come and see the show multiple times to see different people playing. Right, yeah. yeah. Do it. And it's always so different. I love when understudies go on and that it changes the entire vibe of the show. It's so cool. Yes, so how does being on with different Nessas and different Glindas and even different <laughs> Alphabas affect how you play Bach? Because like, yeah. you're especially on stage with the Glindas with, and the Nessas. Yeah, with Glinda, Glinda and Nessa are usually the two that I always check in with before the show. Um, whether it's Allison Bailey and Amanda Fallon Smith who are like mine, um, I will always like stop by their dressing room just to like say hi, chat for a little bit, just like do a daily check-in. Um, and if it's an understudy or a swing that's on, I will I will most definitely check in with them just to be like, is there anything you need? Is there anything I can do to make this performance easier for you? Um, I, I really, really, I love doing a NASA debut. I've gotten to do, I think, two now. That's um, so special. We're doing a NASA's first show is really, really cool because it's, I mean, everything I do is with is with them. So it's, it's really special to share that and to help like guide them through it, just as Amanda did for me when I joined. So um, yeah, I, 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 I always try to check in with the person before they're on. Do you ever, once you get comfortable with performing with someone, do you ever like throw in a little something extra? Because like you have- Oh yeah, my, well. definitely. I would like my performance with Amanda as Nessa is very, is very different than my performance with Jackie Ray. It's, um, it's, it's total chemistry and it just, it's not even really acting choices. It's just kind of the vibe that is created with just by communication happening honestly. Um, 
Yeah. And I think Wicked's really good at doing that, at finding like the right people at the right time. Like, as you said, yeah. like it happens, it happens for a reason. And exactly. I mean, the chemistry like all matches up perfectly with the with every cast I've seen in Wicked on yeah. stage. It's really special. And also going through just the process of being in such a, a monstrous show as Wicked really bonds people, I think. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a crazy experience backstage and on stage and getting to do this this iconic thing that I think whoever you're on stage with, you kind of end up getting really close to just because you're on this roller coaster together. Yeah, and Wicked. You're yeah. like, what? This is happening? <laughs> what was your Bach debut like? What, where was it? It was in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I, I, I learned the show in Portland and then I opened the show in Eugene and um, it was crazy. It was wild. I don't remember much of it. Honestly, I was in such like a laser focused, um, just am I standing in the right place and saying the right things mindset. Uh, and I hope I was acting. Um, actually, Andy Richardson, who is one of the Bach understudies and is a spectacular dancer and just quality human being. Um, shout out to Andy. Um, yes gave me really, really good advice on my, we, I, I think it was actually behind the map, like right as the first, my first show is about to start. He was like, take some mental snapshots of this night because you're not gonna remember it. And that was very true because I have like three snapshots of that night and I don't remember the rest. I remember the opening number. I remember standing in the fog, looking up at Glinda. I remember loathing because I remember I was like hitting a piece of choreography and it was this moment where I was like, oh my God, I'm doing it. <laughs> like, yes. And um, and I remember the curtain call. Um, other than that, I have, I truly, it's actually wild. I don't, I don't remember that performance at all. You're like, I, I completely I blacked out otherwise. Well, I was told it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was told it went well. Um, That's all that matters. Yeah. But it, yeah, and it, it wasn't it wasn't until really like the third or fourth show where I was like, okay, now I have the rhythm of this. Because my put-in also, what's really interesting, normally a put-in is start to finish um, the whole show. But when you're putting in a Bach, Nessa, um, Dillamond, I would say maybe even a Morble, there's really no point in doing the whole show because there's chunks of the show that we're not in. So, um, we'll just kind of like skip around to the places that that are needed. So I really hadn't experienced the entire length of the show and what it would be like in real time until my first audience, which was stressful. <laughs> was it everything you thought it would be by the time it was like your fourth, sh fourth show? Yeah. yeah, it's it's so fun. It is so, so fun. Exhilarating and exhausting and amazing. Do you have a favorite scene in Wicked, whether it's a scene you're in or a scene that you like like to like sit in the corner backstage and watch? Yeah. I mean, the opening number is is a blast. That is, that's like the one thing that no matter what mood I'm in or what the vibe of that show is, it's always like, wow, this is Wicked. It's such a it's such a an explosion of excitement and and spectacle that you can't help but just being like, I am in Oz. Um, what else? I really enjoy Governor's Mansion. I, um, I think because it's not on the recording, the audience doesn't always expect it. Yeah. Um, so, it, and, and, and it happens to have a lot of kind of Wizard of Oz surprises in it. Um, it's also one of the strongest book scenes in the show where it's it's really just that that whole scene is directed and feels like a play, um, which is really cool to to do and and be there with my Nessa and Alphaba and go through that whole crazy scene together. And it's kind of the Nessa's like huge moment to mm -hmm. be a star of the show. So are you, yeah. do you like watch Amanda like, oh my I gosh. Love it. Like, I'm so proud. <laughs> so Amanda and I found out that we were cast um, around the same time. She joined sooner than I did, but we got in touch with each other and had a coffee date in New York City before she left for tour. And we kind of talked about that scene. And I was like, I want to make it 
a little dark. And she was like, oh, I'm so into that. So like we, we had already, before we even got there, we had had a little like powwow on how we wanted to um, attack that, that scene, so. Wow, so when you yeah. all like, when you all did it for the first time together. The we were ready, the video, yeah, we were, were like, like, we were already kind of in tune with each other, yeah. Oh my goodness, and that, I mean, that lucky audience you got to see like, <laughs> that debut, they were like, Wait, it was real and that's you? that's actually a really cool thing about doing the show with an understudy too is that sometimes it'll be a person that I've not rehearsed with or I've ever done the show with um because you know when um one of our swings goes on for Nessa I wasn't a part of her put in so I've never been on stage with her in that role so it's truly happening live where I'm, she's feeding the lines to me. I'm giving it back to her and it is all in real time. I have no idea what she's about to do. It's um, just a professional moment. Yeah. And it, it, that's always really, really fun because it keeps everybody on their toes. It makes it so real and so honest. It's not um, phoned in at all by anybody because it can't be. Um, I love those shows. Yeah. Okay. Glinda or Alphaba and why? <laughs> no pressure. Um, for like my my favorite, who I would want to play, what what is the question? Uh, like general favorite. Just general favorite. It's a hard question. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Glinda, which may be controversial, but I think I am attracted not only as Bach as I have to be obsessed with her, but um, I think that Glinda's arc is really really beautiful. I think. Alphaba is a powerhouse, strong, um, powerful woman, but she is that at the she knows who she is and exists in that power, and that is so incredible to watch. Glinda really goes on a journey from from being pretty shallow to really understanding how the world works, and I think that that's really fascinating to watch. She does. And she's like a little like naive at first. Mm -hmm. She's like very, very naive. <laughs> yeah. She's like full of herself. She's yeah. like, I, I've always been given everything. So like, why am I not being given everything? I think, I think one of, and I mean, I've, I've never played Glinda, so I wouldn't know, but I think what I imagine is one of the challenges that Glinda's go through is how to continue to make her likable for a lot of act one and, and even act two, she's not a very good person. So, um, I think, I think part of what makes that role so good is the actresses that play her are always so talented and keeping her light and funny while kind of making poor choices in in the character. Yes, and I mean everyone loves Glinda, so like yeah. it, it says a lot for like to the actress. It's a hard role, Glinda, yeah. Because like she is shallow, but people are like, Glinda and Elphaba are my favorites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, but I mean, granted, there's nothing like watching an alphabet sing No Good Deeds. So I, that just always brings me joy. I mean, <laughs> chills, goosebumps every yeah. night. And I'm sure, I'm sure you hear different things done every night, even mm -hmm. if it's- I have, well, I, and I have a very cool view of that, um, of that song, which again, I can't talk about, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm off stage on a platform um, and it's, it's a really interesting, just like eye level, view of, of that song and it's really cool that's amazing yeah so what do you think how do you think you're like Bach and how do you think you're different from Bach Ooh, that's a really good question um I definitely share the same insecurities that Bach shares um I do not like confrontation at all. <laughs> so that that is something that Bach and I definitely hold close to us. Um, but I will say that I think Bach is um, a bit more optimistic than I am, which I think is a really wonderful character to play because I I am all I can always be reminded to just be more blissfully happy all the time and and be full of love no matter what um because he kind of exists as that in the plot that's that's kind of like his purpose so you know dj has a lot of different feelings going on because i'm a normal person 
Um, it's always nice to step in the shoes of someone who is just so optimistically happy and full of love no matter what. So were you optimistic when like everything started happening last March that it would only, that yeah. like it would go up for two months? Because I was optimistic. I was like, it's going to be two months. I mean, I think everybody was when we, when we closed the show, it was kind of like, oh, we'll have like a little, like, you know, yeah. three week month break. Um, a lot of people had actually planned vacations during the next city anyway. So it was kind of like, a, oh yeah, this is fine. This is great. We'll be yeah. back in a month, worst case scenario by the summer. You know, nobody knew what it was. So yeah, um, yeah I was definitely um, optimistic, <laughs> like ignorantly optimistic there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it, it's fine. It's all fine. Yeah. Like it's gonna be back before we know it. And here we are like right now, but soon, soon. Yeah, soon. so soon, so, so. soon. When you're touring and performing eight times a week, how do you keep up with, how do you keep up the stamina and how do you like work on your health on tour? Um, so much water, so much water, more water than I ever thought, especially um, when we played Vegas. Vegas yeah. Um, yeah, I was gonna say. Vegas was, I was so ready to leave Vegas. I, my voice did not like the desert. Um, I, yeah, I mean, staying hydrated, going to the gym. Um, I have a vocal warm up. I have a few vocal warm-ups on my phone that are from my coaches that I use daily. Um, I think everyone's show is a little bit different. I mean, if you if you talk to a history, I know Trevante takes ice baths sometimes every night for his body. Um, and you know, my with my track, Witch Hunters is very vocally demanding, and so that's that's its own thing where I, I always try to check in with. Is my placement healthy? Am I are my screams and growls coming from a place that is sustainable? Um, you know, it's it's track specific. So I find that just like a lot of water and exercise and rest. I mean, sometimes just you have to spend the day getting ready for your show. Um, whether that's like sleeping in, getting a massage, going to the gym, doing a long vo vocal warm up, and then it's showtime. So, <laughs> it's like sometimes you can't explore the city that day, even though you right. Work. Right. Like, sometimes it's like I need to take care of myself. Um, yeah, we also yeah. travel with an amazing physical therapist on tour, um, who is always available to us to to work out different muscles, whether it's laryngeal or some place on your body. Um, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Vegas though, because I thought I was going nuts in Vegas. No, a lot I, of actually our um, our witches in Vegas were using the I I don't know what it's called, but it's like the hydration IV um, to stay hydrated. A, a few people in our class did that when we were in Vegas. I was like, I think it's for hangovers, but like <laughs> we were using it to perform. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. yeah, my lips were like so chapped, and I was yeah. like, Is this like? Does this happen to everyone in Vegas? No, like I, I didn't feel very good in Vegas. I was like lethargic. I, and I think I, I just wasn't hydrated, honestly. But um, yeah, Vegas was really, really fun. But I was definitely ready to leave. <laughs> I don't know how people like drink and like go to the bars and stuff and like in Vegas and like walk away Me feeling too. okay. Because like I didn't go to any bars. And no. I was like, I was like, this is a cool city. But like, I feel like my lips are just so dry. Yeah, we also, we were working really hard in Vegas too. We were, that's when um, Talia and Allison and Clavant were put into the show. And we also had our Alpha Standby understudy and Glinda understudy also joining the show. So there were a lot of rehearsals in Vegas. Um, wow. Yeah, Vegas was a lot of work. <laughs> it was an exciting city for, mm. for, for like the show. Right, for the show. I was like, I wish I got to maybe like go see some more Cirque du Soleil or you know, go to a pool, but it was a lot of rehearsal, which is always, which is still fun though. Yes. What do you think makes Wicked such a long running show? Because it's been open since 2003. Yeah. People still love it like they did in 2003. Um, I think it's the plot. I think the story is timeless for two reasons. One, because of Wizard of Oz and everyone loves Wizard of Oz and everybody loves um, exploring a different side of the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, the second thing I think is a lot more political. I think the show exists in a really um, dark, poignant, 
political place that of you know corrupt leaders and um trying to take down a powerful woman of color it's 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 really really intense and i think that that story is always unfortunately one that is relevant um whether it was back in 2003 when we were in the wake of 9-11 or whether it's now with all of the important social yeah. justice things happening um i think it's a really really important story to tell and i think that that's what has kept it alive and will probably keep it alive yeah definitely keep it alive for years to come yeah i can't imagine it going anywhere anytime soon so how would you convince people to come see the show when the tour reopens in dallas oh gosh um i think that it will be a hopefully once in a lifetime experience um I don't think that any, and this this kind of goes for all theater, go see theater post pandemic, um, support artists. But I think that when shows reopen, whether you get a ticket to Wicked or Lion King or Hamilton or Six or whatever it is, um, that first few weeks back is going to be something that ha will hopefully never happen again. Um, it'll be a wild rock concert. The, I think everyone will be so present and, and ready and truthful to the story. Every show will be so clean and, and recently rehearsed and um, everyone there will be so grateful to do it. And so I think that it will be, I, I, I literally can't even imagine the emotions that our company is gonna feel the first week back. And so I, I would implore people that I think you'll wanna be in the audience for it. I was going to say, people are people have been saying on social media that they're going to be a wreck when Nick Linda says it's good to see me, isn't it? And I was going to say, Same. everyone on stage is going to be a wreck too. That's, that's the interesting thing that I think is the big question mark right now is that there are moments in the show that, you know, like you said, the audience is like, I'm going to be a wreck. And I'm like, I don't know how we're going to do it yet. So yeah. like, <laughs> I think, and I, I think that's what's going to make it special. I think there may be moments, those first few performances where, um, something happens and a true live theater experience happens between an actor and an audience where it's like, I am with you, you are with me, and this may take a little bit longer or faster than it usually does, but this is a special moment that we will share. And yes. that's gonna be really, really exciting. It's gonna be the most exciting theater experience ever for people. Yeah, so everybody fly down to Dallas, Texas. I promise it will be a blast. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually, tickets are on sale too. They they were recently on sale. I think last Friday. Yeah, I'm I'm actually in Dallas, so I've been like, oh, amazing. Am I going to still be here when the wicked comes? I'm gonna like I'm I'm gonna try to still be here. Oh, I hope so. I I would love to meet you in person. <laughs> I mean, go. Well, I if I'm not here, I'm gonna fly down probably because awesome. like I have my family home here. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite stage door memory thus far from Wicked? Yeah, actually, um, there was a young boy who wanted to be a stage manager, actually, um, in San Jose. And this was only my s second city. Um, and he came to the show and I was chatting with him after he was asking all types of really intelligent questions about the show. Um, and then throughout that run, he came back like five or six times and stage doored every single time. And I, at one point I was like, do you want to come backstage? <laughs> and, and I, and I showed him the stage management booth and things. And that was just a really, and he ended up sending me a really, really um, wonderful note and gift later on. And it was just really, really sweet. It was, it was a really wonderful um, connection with, with a person. And um, unfortunately we can't do that now with COVID yeah. it's stage doors and backstage tours and, um, a lot of things are going to not be available right. for, I think, a very long time. But um, I'm really grateful that I that I had that experience, and I hope that I, I hope that I can find some way to um, figure out what a stage door looks like post pandemic, so I can continue to have those connections because I really, really do genuinely love um, meeting everyone after and and having a quick chat.
and you got to be like such an inspiration for that kid like that kid got to so. see <laughs> what happens backstage yeah and there's I mean there's always that's that's also what keeps anybody going whenever you're really really tired is somebody in the audience it's going to be their first time seeing a show and yeah they deserve the most spectacular magical performance from me and everybody else so yes yeah so i love talking about wicked but what is your dream role on stage besides bach besides bach okay um i mean i have a few on my list that i still want to do um i would love to do evan hansen i was thinking that <laughs> whole, whole interview Were I was you like, really It'd be good. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I would love to do it. I don't. I don't know if that will. If the universe will let that happen, but I would love to. Yeah. Um, I would love to do Cursed Child. I would love to play Albus in Cursed Child. Ooh. Um, I could see that too, actually. Yeah, there's a few tracks into Kill a Mockingbird that I would love to do. Um. Yeah, and then regionally, I would love to play like Dickon in Secret Garden. Um. I've yet to do Jack and Into the Woods. I don't know if I'm a little old for it now, but <laughs> that Dick, that Dickens song in Secret Garden, though the the Winter on the Wing song, that's my obsession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally my obsession, um, and I think it's so underrated. It's a beautiful score. That show is is so wonderful. Um, yeah, so there's 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 still a few on my list that I wanna that I wanna get done. I really also want to dabble in um, TV and film and start and start in, in that way too. Well, let's manifest all that. And I, I definitely see on it. <laughs> Thank you. I definitely see Dear Van Hansen. Like that's gonna that needs from to your happen. lips. Let's make it happen. That needs to happen. <laughs> What's the funniest thing that's ever happened to you on stage that maybe wasn't funny at the time, but you're like, okay, maybe like now that's funny. Um it was terrifying. I don't know if it's funny. Um <laughs> there was a... Uh, a moment in Witch Hunters, one of my first performances, and any Bach will tell you this, it's the most terrifying part of the show. Um, there's a musical entrance into the second verse that the entire orchestra cuts out into just um, a harp, I think. And the whole ensemble is screaming at you. And so you can't hear anything. Yourself. And so it's really, really hard to count. And I always ask the conductor to give me like a hard cue. Um, but it's it's a really scary part of the show. And there, the, I hadn't experienced that yet live with an orchestra. And so one of my first few shows, um, the, the music cut out, or at least what I could hear cut out. And I thought the show stopped. And I was like, oh my gosh, did, did the show just stop? Did I mess up? Was it my fault? Like, this is all happening in my head in the course of like, probably like one split second. Um, but yeah, my, my, like, my heart just dropped and I was like, I can't hear anything. I think the show just stopped, but I'm gonna keep singing. And I think that's my cue. So here we go. Like, and I think it, I did it right. I might've been a beat off, but like, it was terrifying. Um, Four more things. Yeah, like, I was like, I don't know if it's a funny story, but it was a scary one. <laughs> Reformer things is you just keep going. And sometimes you like tough on yourself after, but it's like no one even notices. Yeah, the, the, funny, thing, the funny things happen in Ozdust. That's that's usually when like when Amanda and I get to like play with each other with the, the lemons and melons and pears and punch. And yes. um, after after we have our solo, I take the wheelchair back into um, what is the like, dancer clump um and we have a little a little the whole morable scene to kind of just like play around with each other we are always in character which makes it even more fun and everyone is so um yeah we get to kind of really just yeah. do some silly things with each other have have you ever had those moments where you're like tough on yourself after a show and you're like i'm like messed up at this part and people are like when did always. what almost every show. Um, I would be lying if I was like, no, I never do that. Um, <laughs> no, especially um, my first month, I was really, really hard on myself. I was, I think because it was so important to me in the show and the history of the show and the legacy, um, and it, because it had taken so long for me to get there, um, I really, really wanted it to be perfect. Um, and so I definitely had to kind of like let go of that a little bit to make it good. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, I, I definitely still still have those those shows where I'm like, oh, that wasn't what it could have been, or 
Um, but that's also, I guess, the beauty of live theater is that you don't get a take two. It is what it is when you're doing it and it's live. Um, it, I mean, is there a moment that you've like realized that, that like people rarely like notice the mistake? Exactly. Mistakes? I'm like, if I have a little hiccup of a, of a, of in my text or in a note, like people are probably not going to notice. Um, yeah. But I have a, I, I do have that like perfectionist bone in me that will just never, never shush. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've heard, like, I've had so many performers in like LA come up to me like after shows in there. I was like, oh my gosh, that was so good. And they're like, no, you don't understand. I was off on like this part. And I was like, yeah, it's like, nobody knows that. Yeah. When, yeah. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting balance because you always want to like, make sure you're the best performer you can be and give yourself notes to make sure that you're at your top game but at the same time be kind to yourself and like things happen yes <laughs> yes exactly so speaking of that have how do you work on self-confidence in this industry wow that's a big question i don't know if i have the answer to it honestly um yeah like it's a journey it's a journey. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not even actually going to pretend like I have an answer to that because I don't. Um, it's something that I struggle with. It's something that I think most performers struggle with. Even the most confident, brilliant talents um, have moments of, am I talented? Will I ever work again? Um, I think, actually, here's what I'll say. Surround yourself with loving friends and supportive people. Um, because if you can't control your own self-confidence and self-esteem, um, you can control who's around you. And I am the biggest hype man for all of my friends. When my friends make Broadway debuts, I am such a cheerleader and I am at too many shows just like, and I'm a walking billboard for them. I'm like, have you seen this person in this show? They're so good. Um, yes. I think. So I think surrounding yourself with people that do that for you, um, just as a, as a constant little nudge that's like, hey, you're talented, keep doing what you're doing. Did you have like field day at your school where you like won sportsmanship awards? I, I didn't, I was never athletic in any way, but. <laughs> oh my gosh, because like, I have like little like. like I'm sure, little... no, I mean, I'm sure that was a thing. I was just saying like, I was never mine. <laughs> I feel like you probably would have been that person to win all those sportsmanship awards though. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like everyone's cheerleader. <laughs> yes, that, I love that because everyone needs that yeah. in their life. Everyone needs that positive person who's like there and being positive, no matter like what tough thing is happening in someone's mm -hmm. life. Who's like, you can do this. You can push through. And it's so easy to do too. You know, I try to just clock it in myself whenever I have a thought that's like, you know, if I'll use, I'll use wicked as an example, let's say, um, Talia has a really epic wizard and I, and I'm backstage and I'm thinking to myself, wow, that sounds really awesome tonight. There's no reason why I shouldn't share that with her. Yeah. You know, like what an awesome thought that I just had. And I should go at some point when she's like not in the, in the midst of the show, be like, that was really good tonight. You know what I mean? Just, I think everyone loves to hear that every now and then. Yeah, even if you're even if you're doing it night after night, it's important mm -hmm. to hear the reminder from your friends. Yeah. So, before I get to my last question, have you been working on anything in quarantine, whether it's singing related or not, that's like kept you sane over this past year? Actually, yes. Um, I mean, I definitely spent a few months doing absolutely nothing and just sitting in my in my sadness. <laughs> so um, that was a thing. Just so everyone's clear. Um, but I actually have pivoted a little bit to voiceover work. And that has brought me a lot of um, joy and um, learning experiences that have been really fun and really fascinating because it's kind of where creativity meets ad agencies and marketing. Um, and that's been really cool to learn about. Um, and I'm going to continue doing it and I hope it turns lucrative soon <laughs> but voiceover work is really cool like lots of like commercial animation video games um i have i'll really pick it up right now i have like my little microphone set right here um yes all the all the equipment yeah so it that's been it's been really fun to learn about and it's been cool to have something tangible um to be like i did that over quarantine um yeah. which is which is nice 
how is it different than like performing on stage since you're you i mean very you're not, <laughs> it, you're not like being like seen and you're not like recording right. yourself like on camera or you're not being seen by an audience yeah well it's it's actually really cool because it's it's solely focused on the voice because like you know it's i'm not like you said i'm not seen so um getting really specific about sounds and how to read a 15 second commercial spot um is obviously very different recording in my closet than performing wicked at the fox theater but like um it's definitely an interesting new new performance tool that i i try to take bits of everything i do so there are definitely like things that i've taken from my stage performing and implemented it in my voiceover work um, and I think that there'll be intricacies in my voiceover work that I've learned that I can bring back to the stage, so. Yeah, and when Wicked does a new promo package, you could do a voiceover. My voice is ready. Yeah. I'll, I'll let the producers know. <laughs> yeah, you could be like, hey, I volunteer to be the voiceover for it and like be the narrator. Yep. That'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you um, could like narrate as like there's video of you like performing on stage. That would be great. I love that. <laughs> yes. Yes, let's make that We're happen. Making so many things happen. That and Evan Hansen, just like manifest it. There we go. Yes. <laughs> so before I get to my last question again, where can people find you on social media? Yeah, um, I am, this is how old I am. I'm like, what is my social is media? <laughs> um, I am DJ Plunkett 100, yes, on Instagram. Um, and I think DJ Plunkett on Twitter. I don't use Twitter a lot. Um, I don't think it's the happiest place, but Instagram, right yeah. <laughs> Instagram is where you can find me. And I don't have a TikTok. Um, but yeah. Maybe in the future. Yeah. But <laughs> Instagram, I'm usually um pretty active on, especially when we go back to tour, like posting pictures of the venue and museums and aquariums and fun things I do around the cities that I go to. Yay. Yeah. Well, what are you most looking forward to speaking of when you go back on tour when Life Theater returns? human connection um just i miss i miss my cast i miss my friends um i am so excited to not look at zoom squares ever again <laughs> um you know every time we have a company meeting it's the we travel with 80 people with cast crew musicians um management so all of our company meetings have had just like little tiny squares just in rows and it's always like, oh, there's that person. There's that person. I miss them so much. Um, so I'm excited to give people hugs in real life. And um, yeah. and yeah, I hope maybe like have a drink after the show at a restaurant or, you know, stay in hotels again and have that field trip kind of vibe again. Um, the short answer is everything. I'm looking forward to everything. <laughs> normalcy. Yeah, normalcy. Coming back. Love that. And soon soon as i can so i'm so excited yeah well thank you so much for coming on and joining me to talk thank about you for topic. having me this was so wonderful of course and i'm so excited to see wicked when it comes back yes yeah, so you'll please let me know when you do too definitely definitely i saw you actually in san jose oh really oh my gosh a while ago okay it was that like that was September of 2019, I think? Yes, 2019-ish. Yeah. yeah, I went with my friend, uh, with my friend Lily to uh, San Francisco and we went to San Jose. Oh, how and awesome. I was like, oh my gosh, he's so good as Bach. Thank you. That, that means a lot because that was when I had literally just joined. You probably saw my like, like 12th show. So like. <laughs> I had seen, uh, well, I think I had seen all three Fox on tour before. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I cannot believe that like, this is like one of his first shows. Oh, th that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. It, it was a fantastic performance. And I mean, everyone who gets to see you as Bach, it's in for a treat when the show reopens. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for watching this episode of Backstage with Becca B. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Becca B Talks TV. Or for more exclusive content from this interview and more, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Backstage with Becca B. Make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and give me a five-star rating. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!